Hallelujah. I think you just gave Jesus a nice little applause. I said, give Jesus a mighty shout of praise. He's the King of glory. He's the King of glory. I said, he's the King of glory. He's the King of glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, we must never get over or become common with the fact that through the blood of Jesus we can approach the throne of grace with boldness. I said with boldness. If you ever become common in your spirit about that, you will lose the awesomeness of God. Because God has allowed through His Son that you could be ushered into a place that even angels fear to tread. Angels look upon you in wonder. That a vessel made of clay. A vessel made from the dust of the earth can actually house God Almighty. This is a wonder. It is a mystery. Can you imagine in heaven cherubim cover themselves and they cry holy 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 every time they look at him they have a fresh revelation that he is holy and it goes over and over and over and over The Bible says innumerable angels worship him. One night I was stood in a crusade in Africa, in the nation of Sierra Leone. As far as my eye could see, there were people. And I stood there and the worship team, they didn't have all that you have here. They had some drum skins and they were beating them. And the choir was singing. And I remember as the glory of God, there were dust clouds in the air. The air was thick with the dust as they worshiped God. And I looked up to heaven and I remember just looking into the stars. And part of me was saying, Lord, how did you get me here? <laughs> how did you get me here and then for a moment the Holy Spirit began to reveal something to me that changed the way I worship God because in that moment the Holy Spirit reminded me of the scripture in Revelation when it speaks about the redeemed of God and it says there will be a silence in heaven that scripture always it baffles me because nowhere in scripture do you ever read of a silence in heaven they worship how can they not worship when they look at him when they when they when they stand before him the Bible says that dark clouds surround him lightning and thunder and you got to see that river the river of glass that flows from it's awesome how can you not worship I remember the Holy Spirit just dropped in my heart he said you want to know why He said, because the angels cannot sing the song of the redeemed. Whew. 
See, an angel does not know what it is to be lost and to be found. An angel can never say that they are washed in the blood of Jesus. That is why when the Lord hears the song of the redeemed, he cannot resist it. It is a sound like no other. You might sing out a tune. You may not have a voice, but I'm telling you right now, that sound is irresistible. It is irresistible to the Lord. That's why the Bible says where two or three are gathered in my name, I shall be with them. That's why hell will fight you to stop that sound from rising out of you. Because worship is not in the head. It's a sound. See, whenever God wants to create, establish, He speaks. Let there be light, and there was light. David said, your praise shall be continually in my head. Your praise shall continually be in my heart. No, he didn't. <laughs> he said, your praise shall continually be in my Because the Bible says that God inhabits the of his When God wants to create, establish, he speaks. So what comes out of your mouth gives God the room to inhabit. Small praise, little room. Big praise, See, when you praise him, you tell him who he is, what he's done, and what he will do. <laughs> and God steps in. That's why some worship, modern worship, scares me because it sings too much about us. That is not worship. If there are any evangelists in here that you want to move in the miraculous, stop singing about you. Sing to him, for him, about him, and watch what he does. Real worship to me, this is how I measure worship. I imagine, can I sing it to him when I stand before him on that day? Because believe me, when we stand before him, you won't be singing about you. You won't be singing, I'm more than a conqueror. <laughs> you will fall on your face and say, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive glory and power and dominion. You are worthy, Lord. Your name is worthy. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. I've seen demons flee at the sound of his name. I've seen people in their hundreds begin to flee the crusade because that devil's like, we got to get out of here now. At the sound of his name.
I feel the fire of the Holy Ghost right now. He is my pursuit. He's my passion. You cannot give what you don't have. A man of God who came from my town, his name was Smith Wigglesworth. You know, I don't know what was in the soil there, but Hudson Taylor, how many know who Hudson Taylor is? Hudson Taylor. Smith Wigglesworth came from my region. Smith Wigglesworth said, I fear that there will be a day that we know how to sing songs, but we, there will be empty hands laid on empty heads. Jesus didn't die to give you a job. He didn't die so that... <laughs> Jesus didn't die so that I could be an evangelist. He died so that we may know him. And the power of his resurrection. That's it. Nothing more, nothing less. It's a fire that burns in our hearts. He just wants to touch his people. To touch his people. Jesus. Jesus. Some people get nervous. I don't know why you're nervous. This is what you pray for. <laughs> you worship him so he comes, and when he comes, we say, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> this doesn't scare me. I love it. Thank God for Christ for the nations. But let me tell you, you can have all the theology degrees you want. But unless you encounter him, it's nothing but a piece of paper. It's a burning heart. It's a burning heart that changes you. Don't worry. She's fine. Glory. 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 Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory 
Glory to God. Glory to God. I feel glory coming in this place right now. Jesus, I give you praise. I give you praise. I give you praise. Just bring me this precious woman here. That's the glory of God all over her. Quickly, help me. Just bring her to me. Help me. There it is. Let the power of God flow through her body. I break the trauma from her body right now. Heaven rain is coming down in this place. Heaven's rain is coming down in this place. Heaven's rain is coming down in this place. Heaven's rain is coming down in this place. I can hear the sapphire of God all over it. Fire! The Holy Ghost. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. the fire of God on you right now. That's the fire of God on you right now. The fire of God on you right now. Jesus, right now. Right now, right now, right now, right now. Now! Now!
Jesus. 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 Lift your voice all over this place, just for 30 seconds. Just lift your voice. Welcome the King of Glory. See, the Spirit of God is ushering you in right now. He's ushering you in right now. His glory is filling this place. Cry out right now, lift your voice. Lift your voice. Stay present. Still in the A, right? We don't have to do too much. I just want us to be here in case he does want more.
Let the, that's it. Let the sound of heaven come out of your voice right now. Let the sound of heaven rise out of your voice right now. That's it, that's it.
You're joining with the angels right now. You're joining with the throne room of heaven right now. You're being ushered in. His glory is filling this place. He's filling every person right now. That you'll never be the same. Open your mouth and flow in the river.
this morning. prophesying right now. Sing it again.
it is well with my soul. I feel the power of God up here so strong. I could just, I could just fall out right now. I just, I, I've been holding on to this podium. Go for it. <laughs> you know, I remember when the Bay Revival broke out. The glory of God just rolled in. Night after night. I'm telling you, the glory would get so strong. I, I used to think I was going to like, I'm serious. It would become so, my whole body would be vibrating. I felt like I was going to pop. <laughs> and some nights I'd be in the podium and I'd just fall out under the power of God. And Pastor Kilpatrick, one night he came to me and said, Son, if you're going to lead this revival, you better find your sea legs. If you're going to lead this revival, you better find your sea legs. So I used to just grip the podium <laughs> and say, legs work in Jesus' name. I think I'm just going to share the word with you just for a few moments. Is that okay? And then we'll open up the altar. You can stay where you are if you're in the altar. Don't, you don't need to move. I got to get on an airplane. If there are any devils on that plane, they're in trouble. <laughs> this afternoon and we're going right into Honduras please pray for us you know about the storm that is coming through the Gulf obviously when I get home we we could be coming home to a major category storm but please pray because the rains are gonna be hitting Honduras and I got video they're setting up all the stadium right now and thousands will be in attendance it's going to be broadcast live on one of the largest television networks, free. To, to over five to seven million people will be tuning in. To hear the gospel of Christ. In Honduras, it's the National Bible Day. There will be, there will be governors, the heads of police, political officials will be in this crusade. And I need your prayers. Pray that we get to Honduras, right? Glory be to God. You want to pray? Someone stand up and pray. Go ahead. I ask that you bless him, Lord. Bless him and protect him. I ask that you send your angels before him, Lord. Send your angels before him. Put the fire of God around him like you did at the, the Israelites at the Red Sea between him and the, the Egyptian army. Wrap him in your arms, Lord. Keep him safe and deliver him there safely, Lord. Lord, this storm, it has a name. We command that storm to move in a different direction, Lord. We command that thing to move in a different direction. 
and go into an uninhabited place of the jungle to where I cannot hurt anybody, Lord, so they can get to this meeting, Lord, and be saved in your holy name. And we ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Give God a mighty shout of praise. Just for a few moments, I'm just going to preach the word. I believe the Holy Spirit has already preached it this morning. Uh, but just turn with your Bibles, please, to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. I'm going to read from verse 13. You may think this is an unusual passage of Scripture to be preached in such a meeting like this. But I believe there's some things the Holy Spirit wants to speak to you. Say amen when you have it. Luke chapter 24, verse 13. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus. Everyone say Emmaus. Which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus, listen to this, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Verse 16, one, a very, very sobering verse. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is that that you have with one with another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? <laughs> Don't you just love Jesus? <laughs> So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death but, and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things have happened. Notice. They're talking to Jesus about Jesus. They're trying to tell Jesus what he was supposed to do and who he was supposed to be. Yes, verse 22. And certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came to saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found him. Sorry, found just as he, sorry, let me read that again. Went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. Then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Watch this. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. I would have loved to have been in that preach. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us. For it is toward evening, and the day is far spent and he went in to stay with them now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he took bread everyone say bread blessed and broke it everyone say blessed everyone say broke and he gave it to them then their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished from their sight and they said to one another, did not our hearts burn within us 
while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us. So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with him gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Glory. Thank you, brother. Just thank you. I want to preach to you just for a few moments on the subject, on the road to a burning heart. On the road to a burning heart. Like I said, I believe the Spirit of God has already preached this sermon this morning. But you see, I remember the moment that the Lord touched me. I remember the moment in that room when the fire of God fell on me. And as I was laid in the floor under the glory of God, I told you last night how the Lord said to me, I have a work for you to do, but if you turn from me, I will not call you again. I remember as he pierced my heart. As his love pierced me. As I laid on that floor, I realized how much I needed him. And how little he really needed me. And yet he had come to me. He had visited me. He poured out his love and it so pierced me that I knew I would never be the same again. You see, when Jesus pierces your heart, your response says, I will follow you. No matter what. I will surrender to you and you alone. And you become a pursuer. You become a pursuer. As the deer pants for water. Oh, my soul longs for you. See, the more you know of him, the more you realize there is to know. <laughs> I know people that can quote scripture nonstop, but they don't really know him. It's in meetings like this, when his presence comes, that he's coming to pierce your heart. your heart so that you know your life is not your own surrender is the fruit of when God comes and says I want your heart see I knew at that moment I was gonna my, my whole destiny changed because now my road was one of pursuing him. I'm still pursuing him now. Every moment, every day, I'm pursuing him. Everything else pales into insignificance. I love the song when it says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of the earth will grow strange dim in the light of his glory and grace that's why preachers that are preaching carnal all the time about carnal stuff all the time something's wrong like God's here as some kind of slot machine that we just put in and he's going to give us mansions and Ferraris and that's that no 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 when you look on his face everything of this earth and God blesses God has blessed my life but that's not my pursuit my pursuit is him he is my all in all it's not the, it's not though that so I can get a promotion he is everything I need. 
the pursuit of him. You see, some of you, you got to make that call right here. God is even visiting you this morning because you got to decide this is my road. I think of the disciples. All Jesus said, this is mind-blowing. All Jesus ever said is follow me. They laid down their businesses. They laid down everything they had and they just. Now we've got to give altar calls where we're going to say how blessed you're going to be and nothing's ever going to go wrong and nothing's ever going to happen to you. Just, just come to Jesus and he'll fix it. But that's not the call. The call is lay it all down. And though he slay me, yet will I. Let me talk to you about the road that Jesus calls you to. Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. See, well, you got to decide to choose the narrow way. Amen. The narrow way is not shaped by culture. It's not shaped by in fashion, what, 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 what is in fashion in Christendom. No, the narrow way. Sometimes you've got to be willing to walk a narrow road that no one else is willing to go with you on. Sometimes you've got to go through, through times and seasons when all hell's let loose. When everything inside of you says, turn back. This is too narrow. This is too lonely. No, no, no. You've got to be willing to walk that road. You see, too many Christians, while the going's good, they want to praise and they're going to do something for God, but suddenly they enter a narrow place, a place where it feels like there's nothing and no one that can help them. I wonder how many really want to walk that road. Paul said to the Galatians, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. See, I was thinking about the disciples. And I gotta get, I gotta get on with the message. I gotta get to where I gotta go. Follow me. You see, can you imagine following Jesus when he's walking on water, when he's raising the dead? Imagine when you're following Jesus and he arrives at Lazarus' tomb and he says, Lazarus, come forth, and the dead man rises. I'd have been like, I'm with him. <laughs> Actually, I'm a disciple. You know the guy that just spoke to the dead man and he walked? Yeah, I'm in his ministry team. Because it's easy to follow when the miracles are flowing. But what the disciples didn't know is there was going to come a narrow way. A place that they never saw coming. A broken road. What do you do when it feels like everything is broken? When the pain is so deep. You see, they never saw the garden of Gethsemane coming. In fact, Jesus, uh, Peter tried to rebuke Jesus for talking about the cross. See, they couldn't comprehend his destiny and his purpose. They didn't realize that following Jesus, actually, their road would become so narrow. You see, while he was walking on water, while he was feeding the 5,000, they were following. They were following and watching. But suddenly, the Garden of Gethsemane, the road became so narrow, they never saw it. And suddenly now, Peter, the bold disciple, the water walker, he's heading for denial. He'd enter the road that would lead him to the place that he denied the Messiah. You might condemn him. You might point the finger at him, which sometimes we call doubting Thomas. But what would you do if your road got so narrow that everything you'd laid your life down for, 
Everything you dreamed and hoped felt like it was falling to pieces. See, I'm becoming concerned that we're raising a generation that all they want is the lights and the smoke machines. And ministry success. But if you want to see the glory of God, you got to choose the narrow way. You know, I preach, I've preached in great Bible colleges across America. And you know, there's this trend that young people don't want to hear anymore, messages on holiness. Because it's just not the message anymore. I've heard preachers say, Nathan, yeah, but you know, you're talking about the blood all the time. <laughs> Are you kidding me? If it wasn't for the blood, I wouldn't even be stood here right now. <laughs> I remember my grandma used to say to me, son, if you're ever in trouble, plead the blood. It's the power of the blood. You see, I was taken to these two disciples on the road to Emmaus. These two disciples that are now walking in the wrong direction, called to follow him. You see, the word Emmaus means warm spring. It's like everything that they thought would happen, everything they dreamed of, everything they'd laid their lives down for, it was over. Now they're on a road looking for comfort. And sometimes if we're not careful, we can allow the enemy to lie to you so much and say it's over, it's over, it's never going to happen, that our faith begins to settle for comfort. We know one of them was called Cleopas. His wife is actually in the Gospels, stood with the mother of Jesus at the foot of the cross. These weren't part-timers. These were disciples. They'd seen the power of Jesus, the glory of Jesus. They'd seen all the miracles. How could it be that in a moment they're walking in the wrong direction looking for comfort? One of them is unnamed. I studied theologians say it could be his wife. It could have even been Luke, the writer. But I believe the Holy Spirit on purpose doesn't tell us the second disciple because that disciple could have been. It could have been me. It could have been me walking in the opposite direction to my purpose, to my calling, to my destiny. They were called to an upper room. They were called to see the fire of God fall. And in a moment, they thought it was over. And now they're walking the road. Looking for comfort. If I could have time to tell you of the people that I've known that were on fire for God and something happened and they never saw it coming and suddenly they're on a road to Emmaus. Never thought I'd have a child in prison. Never thought that this would happen to me. See, it's easy to point the finger but that could have been you. That could have been me. And I don't have time to preach it the way I was going to preach it. But you got to decide in the presence of God, as the glory of God is falling on you, you got to decide that you're never, ever, ever going to turn away, that you're going to walk the road, even if it's a narrow road, even if it's a broken road, even if it's a road where people turn their face from you, that they were connected but are no longer connected, betrayed, whatever that is, you got to decide this is the road that I have chosen.
You see, hindsight is an incredible thing. We can read the scriptures and have hindsight. When we read the road to Emmaus, we know what's going to happen. But for these disciples, they had no idea. You see, I always love the Bible when it gives you detail like seven miles. Why not five miles? Why a seven mile road? When God made the road to Emmaus, did he make it? Exactly seven miles? Because there was something in the broken road that he had to reveal to a generation. See, seven is the number of completion. Actually, this was a miracle road. Actually, this was the road to a burning heart. This was a road that would reveal Jesus in a way they'd never seen him before. See, there was an appointed time. And I'm trying to preach to somebody right now. Even though it's a narrow way, even though you might be persecuted, you might be rejected, if you just keep walking the road, there is an appointed time. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end, it will speak. Keep walking the road, it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it shall surely come. It will not tarry. You just keep on walking. See, what blows my mind is, if Jesus was going to reveal himself to anyone, he could have stood in Jerusalem. He could have just stood right in front of the tomb. He could have gone to the mount and all of Jerusalem would have seen him. But that's not what he did. One of the first times he reveals himself other in the garden is to two disciples walking in the wrong direction. He said, they're the ones I'm going to reveal myself to. See, I'm trying to preach to somebody right now. It ain't over. Actually, if you're going to see God's glory, he comes and finds those that we'd, we'd not choose. You, you, you might see someone today walking in the wrong direction. Don't guarantee that it's over. I promise you this. They're the ones that Jesus reveals himself to. Now Jesus is pursuing them. Two disciples that we've said, they're deserters. They're betrayers. They've left the faith. No, they're the ones that Jesus, he's going after. He said, I'm going to walk the broken road with them. I'm going to walk a road that they think it's over, that they think it's hopeless. I'm going to walk that road. And when I walk that road, by the time I'm done, their hearts will be burning within them. They will know that I am the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I'm trying to preach to somebody right now. You know one of the scariest verses in this text? The Bible says, so it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and he starts to walk with them. Watch this. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not. Is that possible? They walked with him. They knew him. But they could not see him. I could preach on that for the next hour. Jesus came to the children of Israel and he said, Oh, how I love to have gathered you like a hen gathers her chicks. But you did not know the hour of your visitation. You see, Jesus appeared as the resurrected Christ. But that's not the Jesus they were looking for. I'm going to go a little bit deep just for two minutes. Is that okay? Is that okay? Watch this. 
You see, the Bible says that Jesus asked them what was happening. And they said, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. Now, you might not get that unless you know your Bible. Jesus is saying, who are you talking about? And the words that they described, he is a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and the people. They're exact, they are the exact phrases that were used in first century Judaism to describe Moses. Deuteronomy 34, 10 and 12, Acts 7, 22. Those words were used to describe Moses. You see, they weren't looking for a liberator that would die on a cross. They were looking for a liberator that would redeem Israel out of the Roman stronghold. They wanted a now savior. They're describing what was and what Jesus was supposed to be. Jesus had not come to deliver Israel from Rome. He had come to save mankind. And for that, he had to die. What am I saying? See, sometimes you can try and put God in a box that you created. In a form that you've created. And you're looking for a Jesus that fits your form. The Holy Spirit can't move like he did this morning because people are shouting and people are crying and people are shaking. No, 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 that's not God. How do you know? Because if mountains shake, are you telling me you can't shake? See, sometimes we don't see him because we restrain him and we put him in our religious form and Jesus has to look the way we want him to look and he has to move the way we want him to move and sometimes we're, we're shocked that God was actually seeking to move in our midst but we did not know. We didn't know him. See, I pray in this conference you don't leave trying to fit Jesus in the form that you thought you knew. I pray that the Holy Ghost has blown open your box. And he says, I'm going to show myself in a way I've never shown myself to you before. I'm not coming in the form you think I'm coming in. I'm coming in a way that will set you free. I'm coming in a way that will liberate you. I'm coming in a way that will rock your world. I'm trying to show you my glory. I'm trying to take you from revelation to revelation, from glory to glory, from faith to tell you a story real quick my grandmother was a holy ghost praying grandmother my grandfather when I was lost in the world she'd reach out for him and at three in the morning he'd be not in the bed and she'd be like where are you and he'd be on his knees crying out for my salvation my grandfather died and he went to be with the Lord and it broke my grandmother's heart they'd never spent a day apart if you mentioned his name, even years after, she'd just break out crying. She was locked in a season of mourning. I get saved and I begin the meetings in my local church, my father's church. And within a year, people started driving from all over the country. Three in the morning, people had been laid down the side of their cars. They never made it to their vehicle. <laughs> The police started pulling people outside the church because they were driving too slow. They thought they were drunk. <laughs> One precious woman, the, the, the policeman said to her, where have you been? She said, I've been in there, the church. He said, what? <laughs> My grandmother came to me. She was a Pentecostal woman. She said to me, son, we prayed for your salvation. She said, but what's happening in your meetings? <laughs> she said, I, I really want the Lord to move, but people are shaking, people are falling out of the seats. 
People are crying out. People are laughing. People. I said, Grandma, don't worry about it. I said, you prayed for me. Why don't you come to the service? She said, are you sure, honey? I said, yeah. I said, but listen, you got to wear pants. <laughs> now you think I just shot the Holy Grail right there. <laughs> she always wore a skirt below the knee. I remember that Saturday night, she walked in the church and she had pants on. I'm like, get her, Jesus. Get her. Now, my grandmother, she was a godly, godly woman. In our region, one of the biggest churches, my grandfather was the elder. And when dancing first came in and people were dancing, it was a major thing. And my grandmother went in and fasted for days and said, God, show me. And God showed her in the scripture. And it released life into the Pentecostal movement of people. See, you guys don't even realize, like, you, what you saw today, they would have been like, <coughs> am I right? And I'm preaching like this. As I'm preaching, I just heard this. Woo! I'm used to that, so I kept on preaching. Woo! 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 Now my grandmother, you could give her a million bucks and she wouldn't take the podium, no way. But she was on that second row She rolled out of the seat while I'm preaching. She rolls down the aisle, takes a left, and rolls right across the front. I was just looking at my grandmother like, Lord, touch her, but please go gentle. She laughed so uncontrollably, but people didn't realize it wasn't just the rolling and the laughing. God was breaking open something in her life, the mourning, the loneliness. And she, she said to God, God, why did you leave me here? Why didn't you just take me? But God had to reveal himself in a way because she was about to see what they prayed for, what they fasted for, what they cried out to God for. Jesus was revealing himself right in the midst of a broken road. See, the Bible says that Jesus starting with Moses. You get that? Jesus said, okay, that's where you're at. I got to get you from there to a point that I can reveal myself and my glory. And your heart will burn within you. Jesus said, I'm going to start where you're at. Okay, you're at Moses. I'm going to walk you from Moses. And the Bible says he takes them to every prophet. Can you imagine walking with Jesus? <laughs> you remember the Red Sea? That was me. You remember the tabernacle? That was me. You remember the sacrificial lamb? That was me. You remember the Shekinah glory? That was me. You remember... <laughs> You remember Moses? He was just a foreshadow. That was me. You see, he was revealing himself. He said, I am that I am that I am. Oh, glory. <laughs> and Jesus starts to open the scriptures. 
I'd have done anything to be in that breach. Can you believe it though? It wasn't the preach. They heard it, but they still didn't see him. See, this morning I said the Holy Spirit was preaching because it wasn't about the preach. And I'm going to show you. The Bible says that when they get to Emmaus, Jesus would have gone further. In other words, he'd have just kept on walking. But something had to happen. The Bible said they constrained him and said, abide with us. That is the key. same glory and that same fire that has fallen I'm taking it with me and you see the Bible says that as soon as they said that Jesus goes in with them now if you didn't hear any other bit of the sermon hear this I would have imagined that he went in there and laid hands on them, breathed upon them, said, you better get back to Jerusalem because I'm about to come with fire. But he doesn't. He takes him to the table. institutes the Lord's Supper he recites the scripture from Exodus he's speaking of when Moses makes the covenant with God and they tell, take the loaves see the priests every Sabbath would take 12 loaves for the 12 tribes of Israel and they called it the bread of presence <laughs> the actual literate interpretation what it should be called is bread of faith. <laughs> yeah, you're getting it. You're getting it. So Jesus takes him to the table. He says, you want to know who I am? Psalm says that God has prepared a table. going to have intimacy with the Lord, it comes at the table. He said, you want to know who I am? I'm going to break the bread of presence, the bread of face. You see, Jesus takes the bread he blesses it he breaks it and he gives it to man that's exactly what God wants to do with you he takes you 
He blesses you. He breaks you. wasn't the sermon that did it. When he broke the bread of faith, the Bible says they knew him. <laughs> That's why this morning the Spirit of God came in like he did to break the bread of faith. Some of you came for a sermon. He said, no, I want to take you to the table. And it was only then that they knew him. See, all my life, when I go into that stadium tomorrow, all I'm going in is to usher them to the table. normally do but the presence of God's here so strong it really should have been a 14 mile road because it wasn't over at 7 actually that encounter with two disciples going in the wrong direction they were taken to the table revealed to them the bread of faith. Get into the presence of God. That's what changes you. This morning, the Holy Spirit's been preaching. You see, they go from a broken road and now they're going back to their destiny. Back to the upper room. They saw Jesus in a way they'd never known him before. How many believe you're going to come out of these meetings and say, Lord, I've seen you in a way that I've never seen before? There's a holiness here this morning. It's not about me coming and lay hands on you. There's a consecration. You may be on a road to Emmaus this morning, trying to find comfort. But I want you to be awakened. Jesus is on the road. And he wants to bring you to the table. They became witnesses of Christ in his glory. <sighs> Isn't it funny that when God when Jesus revealed himself, they looked back and they said, 
You remember when we were on the road? Yeah. We thought it was over, right? Yeah. But when he spoke to us, did not our hearts burn within us? <laughs> I can look back off of my short life. See, you watch those videos of just some of our recent crusades, but every time I look at them, I see the fight. I see the road to Emmaus. I see the broken road, the times I thought it was over. But I look back now and I say, it did not my heart burn within me the whole time. Reinhard Bonnke, a great man of God, I sat at the table with him. And he once said this, someone asked him a question, they said, how do you keep the fire of God burning? He said, that's the wrong question. The fire of God keeps me burning. <laughs> I'm going to hand the microphone. You feel that holy hush right now? See, I can't do anything more. You, you have to respond. Make a covenant with God. Say, Lord, I'm tired of turning this way and that way. I choose the road that pursues after you. Those of you from Christ for the nations, you may be, God's called you to be a missionary and a family, whatever God's called you to be. Don't make that your idol. Your call is to pursue Him and say, Lord, abide with me. Your greatest revelation in ministry in your whole life is how to come to the table of the Lord. That is the secret. To come to the table of the Lord and to eat and to drink. And sometimes the greatest revelation of that is on the broken road. Last year it felt like all hell was let loose in my life. I heard the enemy say to me, I'm going to destroy you. And there were days that he felt like he had. disciples heading in the wrong direction became witnesses of the glory of the resurrected Christ. Just lift your hands and say, Lord, I come to the table Jesus, take 
take the bread. Bless it. Break it. Feed me that I may feed multitudes. Give me a burning heart. Let your fire burn in me and never be quenched. May I never look for comfort. May I keep my eyes on 